Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so before the break, I was explaining that we we're going to look at very simple uh, sets, so typically cantor sets. Um, and we want to just try to get a handle to get some estimates by some methods on their size, their dimension. And so I'm restricting myself to the class for which we have more success, which are limit sets or attractors for iterative function schemes. I'm also restricting myself to the very simple case of uh, contractions on the interval, both for not notational simplicity and also because it cuts down on the hypotheses I have to make. But the methods uh, are quite general, so they do apply to some of the other examples I mentioned. And um, there are three methods, and let me try to dispatch the first method very quickly, because it's kind of well known and easy to, to read up on. Uh, so basically, the downside to, to looking at general C1 contractions is that they're not similarities. They're not of the general form x goes to something affine. If it was, life would be much easier. Why is that? Well, because if you do have um, a bunch of contractions, so I'll write them SI rather than TI, because now the S stands for similarity. Maybe T still for transformation, I'm not sure. And uh, if we do have this setting, then there's a theorem available to us which tells us um, what the uh, dimension is. And it's a very well-known theorem um, called Moran's theorem, dating back to 1946. Um, and what it says is that you look at your contractions, which you have k, they have some numbers ri, these ri's all have to be between 0 and 1. And following Maris's, Maris's advice, I'll make it bigger than 0. And then what we do is we uh, look at uh, just this function. So we take t goes to ri to the power t, these are all numbers smaller than 1. And if you plot this thing as, as a function, here is t, there's my function, and then when it crosses the line, um, the vertical height equal to 1, then that gives you a solution to the dimension. Easy. It's a very easy, e easy statement, relatively easy uh, proof. Um, uh, Moran uh, was not a student of Besikovic, as many people think. Uh, he went to Besikovic and asked, this is in Cambridge, and asked if he could be a student, and Besikovic said no. So he went off to do something else. Um, and if you read his biography of Moran, it's kind of interesting. So apparently uh, when he was younger, before he went to university, uh, he had a, uh, I think he had a, an emergency appendectomy. He had to have his appendix removed in a hurry. Uh, but it's unfortunately it happened just after dinner. So during the operation, uh, you're not supposed to have operations if you've just eaten. Uh, and so there were some complications due to that. And uh, he had to have a, a a uh, and uh, there were complications due to that. Anyway, so if you read his biography, he had a very unfortunate uh, medical experience when he was younger. Um, but his theorem is still very nice. Um, so if we're given a bunch of uh, contractions, uh, we need a, a general bunch of contractions in an iterative function scheme. Uh, how are we going to use the affine approximations? Well, the obvious way, uh, which you can read in the book of um, and Tarkins, um, is to take your contractions and then re replace them by affinities, similarities. And so how do you do that? Well, you get an overestimate and a lower estimate. That is, you look at the similarities where you choose the contraction rates to be the slowest or the fastest, according to these guys. And then the idea is that you compute the, uh, the dimension for these two guys. And then what we get, uh, so solving, solving for what? So we call this upper and lower. Uh, so solving for uh, the values d bar and the upper bar smaller than 1 uh, with, well, uh, affinities uh, for um, Similarities satisfying this condition, so that would be the summation i equals 1 up to the word k uh, of ri bar to the d, upper or lower, one of these things. So that would be that guy equals 1. And I solve for the other uh, family of similarities using the other estimate, so that would be ri upper, I guess. Power of d or something, maybe upper, 
So if my signs are the right way around, then it should imply that the dimension of the guy we're actually interested in is going to be sandwiched between these two values that will be bigger than this lower estimate and bigger than this upper estimate. Unless I've got the signs the wrong way around, in which case you have to switch it. But basically, we approximate the thing above and below by the worst possible case and the best possible case for the contractions, and it gives you a, an upper and lower bound on, on the dimension, uh, which is, in general, particularly bad. Um, so you can improve this, of course, by doing something, and you improve it by replacing um, your k maps by more maps, for example. So um, this can be improved. Well, the first method would be, instead of just looking at my k contractions, which I, uh, so let me just say this right now. So I replace the maps uh, ti, i equals to one up to k by, well, let's fix some value m, and I replace this by just families of so ti1 goes down to ti m. So before I had k maps, now I'm going to have, um, I guess, uh, k to the m maps. And uh, lo and behold, this is again a family which forms an iterator function scheme on the unit interval, and it has the same uh, limit set, attractor. And when you try to apply this method up here, you're in better shape because there are more branches. And in particular, you can get these values d bar and d closer together. And another approach, so this is the, the approach which is described in, in Alice and Tarkins. And the other approach is uh, described uh, in the case of um, the article, an article of McMullen, but it's also well known. And so the principle there is that uh, we now keep the contraction, but we replace the interval uh, 0, 1 by a bunch of smaller intervals. Um, well, let me call them cylinders because the words appeared already. Cylinders. And these would just be the images ti1 up to tim of 0, 1. So I still have the same maps, t1 up to tk, but now I'm going to look at them not on the interval 0, 1, but I'm going to see what the images look like for these smaller intervals. And the advantage of this is that I can do a similar trick to up here. I can bound the derivative not of, I can bound the derivative of each of the ti's, but now on a much smaller interval. So again, that gives me bounds to get closer and closer together. So these are not very uh, sophisticated uh, methods, but they, they do give you some sort of bounds. Um, OK, so let me just dispatch the, the uh, case. And let me just mention this is the approach which is used in another paper of Lerman and Mullen. OK, so this is basically um, the first approach. But that's not the one I want to concentrate on. So next, I want to talk about uh, the case of using determinants. Now, in order to do that, I have to uh, remind you of the connection between uh, these things um, and also um, uh, dimension. So how does that work? Well, I have to uh, remind you in particular of Bowen's formula. And the reason that I wrote down the Rand's theorem is because you can think of the, the Bowen uh, pressure formula as being a generalization of Moran's theorem. Uh, so uh, I, I'll try to leave, leave it on the board. Hello. Before you go to approach uh, two, can yeah. you say why this, this method is slow? Um, it's slow because the, the bounds, of course, depend on these derivatives, sorry, of these values here. So um, it depends on how, as, as you look at these, these methods, as you look at these intervals getting closer, smaller and smaller and smaller, or you look at these maps being approximated in some appropriate way, then the difficulty is in how fast you can get these guys to close. So what happens is that they don't close fast. It doesn't get close enough. But it gets exponentially close, right? 
Well, in some sense, yes, but uh, it, it doesn't really help in, in, in most applications. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. I prefer. Yes. I'm sure it's great. Yep. No, yeah, I, I, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an excellent approach, but it has limitations if you want. I've made several experiments with this. That's the way of life. That's great. Uh, no experiments in the sense of computer, but experiments with definition. Uh, so uh, the other approaches, I've written one and two, I meant to write two and three. Uh, two and three uh, depend on uh, the Bowen pressure formula. As I said, I, you can think of as an extension, a generalization of what happens in this particular case. And so, in order to remind you of that, I have to tell you what the pressure is. And I'm only going to consider a one parameter family, so let's assume that I have a real number t. <laughs> and then I'm going to define the pressure function uh, over here, apparently. So, p is going to be just a function from the real line to itself. So far, so good. And how is it defined? Well, it can take a parameter t onto some number, and the number I'm going to define to be the limit as n tends to infinity, 1 over n, uh, the log of something. And the something is I'm going to sum up i1, i2, up to ik. I don't think I mean ik, I mean in. What are these? Well, these are just values 1 up to k. They're just indices to my contractions. And then what I do is I look at the composition Ti1 composed Ti2 composed up to Tik. So that's a contraction. I take the derivative of this, I evaluate it at whatever my favorite point is, which I take to be zero at the moment, and then I raise this to the power t, because otherwise it's not a function of t. And maybe I should put a bracket around this because I like to put brackets around things with log stuff. So it's, it's an object, and uh, the limit exists just by some, some calculations and stuff. So let me put the word define, the pressure. What does this one do? Well, it's got some nice properties, um, which I will briefly state, which I'm sure we all know. Uh, uh, well, first of all, it's going to be decreasing. Sometimes my p's look a bit lowercase. I'm sure they should be lowercase or uppercase. It is monotone decreasing, <coughs> strictly. Um, oh, should I have said that? Oh, okay. That's p. That's two. p of t is, is a smooth function. In fact, it's actually real analytic, but smooth is good enough for most things. And it's also, I'm going to risk writing that it's uh, convex. Possibly I mean that it's concave, <laughs> since I can't distinguish between the two, uh, except by a picture. And the picture is going to be uh, like this. So here is our function. It's going to look like that. Somehow that doesn't like a very good thing. Yellow is a better colour for these things, so don't mind. Um, so that's going to be my function. So here is the axis, here's zero, here is t, this is p of t, and it's going to cross the axis presumably at somewhere log of k maybe or something. Um, doesn't matter. But the theorem uh, is the following. <coughs> so it's usually attributed to, to Bowen, although in the more general setting, it's due to Ruel. And uh, what it says, of course, is that um, the uh, dimension of uh, the set X associated to these contractions 
uh, for the iterator function scheme is uh, the uh, zero of that map. So p goes to p of t. So this value here is going to be the dimension of x. And so in some sense, it's, it's like a generalization of uh, Hutchinson's theorem. And uh, somewhere down here is a note, maybe. Note uh, for similarities. Similarities. Then you could just compute the pressure function uh, with contractions R i i equal one to k. Then maybe the pressure function would actually just be equal to. Would you believe uh, the log of the summation i equals one up to k R i to the power t? Something like that. And if you stick that into there, then hopefully it comes out as this guy over here, or that, something like that. Uh, so uh, this this um, result was in a paper of Bowen. Uh, it was actually his last paper. He died at the age of 31 uh, on holiday, which is not a good thing to do. Don't go on holiday. Um, what else can I say? Uh, so his paper was actually unpublished at the time. So it had been submitted, but it hadn't been accepted. But it was accepted. And the paper was about, not about iterative function schemes. It was about, um, it was about what? Um, quasi servers. quasi servers. thank you. Um, and then the generalization uh, to other systems was due to Ruel a few years later. He was interested particularly in Julius S, hence the generalization. Okay, so that was. Uh, yeah, so the, the Caroline has a joint paper with Bowen, which is about coding geodesics, but I think she was involved in the. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit before my time, but I'm uh, happy to believe all these things. Okay, so I needed to, to state the, the Bowen result uh, in order to get me to, to where I wanted to be, well, in some sense, and uh, where did I want to be? I wanted to be at in a position to tell you about the determinants. So let me describe the, the first method, the second method. And this is the method that's supposed to tell us something about um, computing the dimension for these iterative function schemes, um, but not by approximation, but by doing something else. That was me fully busting my closing the board. So this is going to be an approach uh, to what I call determinants. And um, oh, there's a survey of this stuff as well. There's a survey uh, by uh, Jenkinson Itself, which is going to appear, or something, uh, in some volume, which is uh, this uh, memorial volume to Anatolia Cattle, which is being edited by Hasselblad and some guys. Um, and it just talks about this sort of stuff. Uh, but this, in this setting, we need some extra information. So we need an extra assumption. What's the extra assumption? Well, we need that the maps uh, Ti from 1 up to k might contractions, which before were just any happy old C2 maps, uh, to be analytic. Um, you don't really need to assume they're analytic, but for the method to give you something useful, you want to assume that they are analytic. So let's just say that. Uh, so what does that mean? Uh, it means, for example, that if I have my, my original interval and I have a, a contraction uh, called uh, Ti, then I want to assume that there is some extension into the complex plane so that uh, when I look at the image of this on the, the map, then it, it maps strictly inside like that. So what does this picture represent? So this was my original interval, 0, 1. U is going to be some neighborhood. And what I need is that the image of it, which is going to be Ti of U, 
is, is strictly in size length. So if you have an analytic map, it comes for free if it's a contraction, because if you choose a neighborhood small enough, then the map, the, the extension of TI is still going to be contracting. It's a complex extension. It's a complex extension. So that's what I'm assuming these to be originally real analytic. And here I'm taking this to be the complex extension. So here is Right. Right. Hmm? Will analytic imply such an extension if you have contraction? Yes, it yeah. does. It comes for free. But uh, I, like to, I like to be very uh, I know, emphatic on these things. So there you are. So we, we have this uh, analyticity. So we need to assume this as well. Um, but we're in good shape. So, so uh, I've written down. Oh, yeah. So here is an example again. We hope the example works. Uh, so, if we consider the case um, of uh, Ti from 0 to 1 of the form uh, Ti of x is equal to 1 over x plus i. i is not the complex number here, really. let me call it something else. Let me call it j. I'm slightly worried I've introduced the complex numbers and i's appearing might be a bad thing. So, let me call it j. And then, in this case, um, we can let uh, u, which is supposed to be a neighborhood of the unit interval, uh, be equal to, if I remember correctly, it's something like uh, z minus 1 is smaller than 3 over 2. Or, if that doesn't work, something else does. But basically, um, the idea is that this neighborhood should be mapped inside itself by the obvious extension of this to the complex plane. Okay, so uh, let me try to say more about what I mean by this method. And I need some notation, so I use the following notation, which I've sort of borrowed from um, Balash and uh, Karoy, except not very well, I'm afraid. So I'll take, um, I denote uh, an interval of what? Well, these are just the digits 1 up to k strings of length n, and I'll write the word of length of the string just by putting these vertical brackets. Uh, and then what I'll do is I'll write t subscript i just to be the composition of these contractions. So he's also going to be a contraction from the interval to itself. They're all contractions, so the composition is. And then I'm going to let xi, this is going to be a point, and this is in the unit interval, and this is going to be uh, the uh, fixed point. So it's a unique fixed point for each of these compositions of guys. So given any n, I can always define this. It's a bunch of guys. So there'll be k to the n maps, and they'll all have fixed points and stuff like that. And then the idea is that we want to associate to this, this bunch of numbers, so there'll be infinitely many, for every n there will be k to the n, so we want to associate to these bunch of numbers a complex function. And so I will define it as follows, so here's the definition. So uh, we define the uh, determinant. So it's, it's going to be a complex function um, associated to any real number. The real number is relevant because of this picture over here. And so how do I define it? So it's going to be a complex function, mm -hmm. about writing to be the complex function. And it's going to be noted by z goes to, it's d z t. So t is a, just a value I'm carrying around. For every t, I'm going to get this complex function. And it's going to be defined to be uh, the exponential of, and then I put minus sign n equals 1 to infinity z to the n over n. It's a function of z. And then I sum up something. Well, I sum up over all of these indices, 
So it's all the guys of length equal to, to n, which will be k to the n for um, any particular value of n. And then I put inside here uh, the derivative of this contraction map at the point which is the fixed point. And then I raise it to the power t because I've got to have a t in here somewhere. And then on the bottom, just for fun, I put in an extra term which is t i prime. Um, or the same thing, derivative x i, and that might be it. Okay, so what does it do? Well, it takes this infinite amount of data, all these numbers, and it bundles them up as a complex function, and it comes out as this particular guy uh, here. And so it'd be good if this definition actually made sense, and so um, for a given uh, t, then you get that this converges, this bit converges for the absolute value of z are sufficiently small. So it makes sense as a complex function on some domain somewhere. Uh, moreover, it has the property that uh, it has a function it actually has an extension to the entire complex plane. So it converges in some region. It's a metal complex plane. So it converges down here, and then it extends over here. So it converges. And the extension to C uh, requires this uh, analyticity property. That's where it came in. If we didn't assume that, we couldn't, we couldn't get that out of class bit. Um, and this bit always confuses me, but if I get it right, then uh, for a given T, um, we have that um, z goes to dz of t, so as a function of z, it has a zero at e to the minus p of t. So in order to get a handle on the dimension of our set, what we'd like to know is the pressure function, this guy, and the way to get to the pressure function in this picture is via this complex function. I. Extends analytically to C? Yes. Uh, yeah. Uh, if I hadn't put the minus sign in there, it wouldn't. It would have holes. But uh, this is the difference between what are called determinants and zeta functions. So in zeta functions, you, like, like the Riemann zeta function, you have poles, and that's because there's no minus sign there. But in this case, um, what happens is that it does extend um, analytically to the entire complex plane, which is supposed to be a good thing. And moreover, within this, uh, within this uh, extension, there is a zero, which will be e to the minus pressure of t. So if you want to know, um, if we want to find um, the, the, the dimension, we want to understand the pressure, if you want to understand the pressure, one approach is to try to understand this complex function. So it's what easy. For the, the the this one. Because it is close to one. Yeah, it's going to be close to one. So if I hadn't put that in, mm -hmm. most of this would still be true. Uh, but if, yeah, so, so, so the reason this term appears here is because it makes it easier to estimate this quantity. So it certainly makes sense not to put this in, but in terms of numerical applications, it turns out that this helps speed things up a bit. Um, what about zero at uh, exponent minus p of t? If you don't put uh, the same. No, but the zero will be there, or whatever. I mean, so if if, if even if I'd assumed that the maps are only C two, then what would happen is that I get an extension to a slightly bigger region, including the zero at that point. But what happens is that I want to sort of winkle out English expression um, the pressure. And, and that will come from knowing more information about the, the function. So somehow the analyticity 
um, putting in these extra terms helps leverage things a bit more. So it would certainly be the case that if I uh, didn't put that term in or if I only work with C2 <laughs> functions, I'd have still have a pole here in its extension. The extension wouldn't be to everywhere, but in this region. But it would still be it would be harder to actually get the information out. Um, so let me try to uh, just briefly uh, remember where I put things. Uh, so let me get rid of this. Maybe I'll leave the uh, in the bottom stuff up for a minute. And so let me write down something that uh, tries to explain what we're doing. So, uh, therefore, to find the dimension of x, which is my goal, or at least to get some estimates on it, um, well, if I have the value t is equal to uh, the dimension of x, if I was lucky enough to do that, um, then what we have is that the function z goes to d uh, z of dim x. So I take the magic value t to be dimension of x, and then I look at this function, and this has a zero. At z equals 1, because <coughs> this following formula, just combining these two, two statements. So this is using pressure formula. So some highly uh, evocative picture is you could imagine I'm now plotting uh, not the pressure function, but here um, I think you've complex explained somehow as being real, but that's okay. And so I plot different kinds of uh, functions, and if I'm lucky enough but I choose t to be the dimension, and it's going to go through here. So this is a plot for d, z, uh, dim, x. But more generally, I'm going to get other curves, which would just be any old z of t. So what I want to do is I want to find um, a value um, of t for which this complex function has a property that it has a zero at t. Uh, one, and then we're done, so to speak. So uh, how do we do that? Well, the slight complication here is that it's a rather complicated looking expression, and it involves infinite amount of information. So what we need to do is to approximate this by something else. And so that is kind of easy-ish. So let me write it as a problem, or maybe it's an issue. Let's see. So d uh, z t contains infinitely many data. So we need to approximate it. So <coughs> approximate. What do we want to approximate it by? Well, it's a function of a complex variable. It's an entire function. So let's try approximating it by a polynomial. So what we'd like to write is that uh, z of t is going to be equal to something. So the first thing I'll do is I'll take the power series expansion in z at the value 0. So that would be uh, 1, if I've got the constant right. And the next term would be a1 of t times uh, Z, because there's still a T hanging around. Uh, the second term will be A2 of T, Z squared. And then you just keep going. And then uh, you get to, to the limit of what you can ask your computer to do. So if you go up to um, the 25th term in this expansion, then it involves periodic points up to period 25, which is kind of a large number. And so this is the approximation. So this is approximation using uh, xi with 
by less than or equal to 25. But then, unfortunately, it, there is other stuff as well you have to deal with. And so the next bit is going to be some more terms. So plus, so the next term will be a26 up to t uh, times z to the 26. And then you just keep going up to something else. So it's, let's say, a500 times uh, t z to the uh, 500. So this is the next set of terms to deal with. And then these uh, can be bounded using computational estimates, computed, 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 computed estimates, and a certain amount of function analysis. And then when you get up to the higher terms, which will be a501 of t, z to the 501, etc., then even computing with some effort these, uh, these coefficients is getting harder, so you just use a general bound, which is due to uh, Ruel and Grothendieck. Although Grothendieck got it wrong, but Ruel got it corrected by some estimates due to David Freed. Okay, so basically you want to, to use uh, this approximation to this function to determine um, the dimension of, of x, and you want to know that this approximation is going to be a good approximation to this, so you need to bound all the stuff that you're not using, and that just uses lots of stuff. Um, the, the downside to this is that it's kind of computation intensive because you have to compute lots and lots and lots and lots and lots of fixed points. That takes a lot of time. Uh, and, and the computer has to memorize most of them for all of its life. And so that also takes a lot of time and memory. Uh, and it's, it, 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 it stops basically when you get to this level of approximation because beyond that, um, it gets too hard to actually apply it. So as a method, it's, it's got a downside. Uh, the, the upside is that if you want to have an estimate which is accurate to, say, uh, you know, a dozen decimal places, then you don't have to use quite so much effort, and it's quite fast. So it works quite well for moderate systems, and it was used by uh, Bourguin and Kontorovich and these guys to, to apply it in some, some context, just to get some estimates of some stuff. Uh, stuff being uh, estimates on um, uh, sets E, X, or E, A, as I call them. Okay, so it's, it's how it works. And the reason it's called a, a determinant is something I haven't told you, which is the reason that there is a meromorphic, uh, sorry, an entire extension to the complex plane. So the idea is that the determinant, uh, sorry, it's called D, uh, Z, and T, is actually uh, the determinant of i minus z times l of t, where uh, here this is a, a transfer operator, which will reappear a bit later, but I haven't got around to it yet. So it's a transfer operator on uh, analytic functions. And this determinant here is in the sense of a Fredholm determinant. Any other kind of determinant, really. Uh, Fred Holm, uh, let me see, um, yeah, 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 nuclear. So the operator here, it turns out to be a compact operator. It's got only countably many non zero eigenvalues, which allows you to define this, this thing. So I, I mention this only because I called it determinant, but I didn't really explain what, what it was a determinant of. But there's an operator hiding in the background, which is actually of trace class. And then this thing actually turns out to be the determinant of that operator. But that doesn't really matter. It's just a method. OK, so that was uh, dispatching, um, hopefully, the uh, second method. So what I would like to do is to start by introducing the third method, which is actually slightly more efficient in, in the examples I've been talking about. And it's also very easy to explain. It doesn't involve a lot of 
um, operator theory, it doesn't involve a lot of complex analysis, it doesn't involve very much. Um, I kept my tap, I kept my uh, cloth very dry, but poured my water over it, which was probably not such a great idea. Uh, maybe I will just uh, take this cloth. So let me try, therefore, to begin by talking about the third method, which is the one that I wanted to uh, concentrate on. And uh, hearing at the clock above, uh, would I have 15 minutes? 15. Hmm? 15, right. Going to the method of these coefficients. Yep. One try to use Cauchy estimate to know in complex situations. Yeah, it tends. And, it, and you have some bounds, then you can take just integrals. Right? Yeah, you, well, you, you throw you throw whatever you can at it. So since since it's based on um, operator theory, there are there are various um, wild type um, operator bounds, uh, and so there are things called approximation numbers that tell you how to approximate. Um, how fast you can approximate operators by finite rank operators. So it uses lots of bits and pieces that we found in books. But yes, I mean, basically it's a combination of complex analysis and uh, operator theory. No, no dynamics much, I have to say. Okay, so if you uh, got lost in the last uh, bit, don't worry, because it's disappearing. And I'm just going to talk now about the third method. So it also uses the, the Bowen approach, um, but in a slightly different uh, way. So let's call this uh, method three. And I still call it the Minimax method, although it's not entirely clear to me why I call it that, but I have to call it something. Um, so this uses, directly uses, Uh, so what I call transfer operators are sometimes called um, Ruel operators or sometimes parent Frobenius type operators, depending on the context. Um, but in this case, I don't assume any, any analyticity, so I only have to look at things that are C1. So let me look at C1 functions on um, the interval. So this is going to be a Banach space of uh, C1 functions. So that's from the interval of itself. And uh, if you do the norm, so the norm of the function f would be uh, basically the supremum of the derivative, so it's the maximum slope of the function. I've written x equal to y because I was thinking of the uh, whole the continuous, it doesn't matter, it's x between 0 and 1. And I also add to it the, just the supremum of the values, so x less than 0 less than 1 of f of x. So some highly evocative picture. Here's the function f, and so I'm interested both in its supremum and also in its largest uh, slope in absolute value, which is probably somewhere around about here. So if I were to write this as so, uh, this would just be the slope of the derivative, then this height here would just be this picture of that, and this slope here would be zero, uh, whatever it is. Uh, well, also minus, I guess. Uh, F by infinity. So, given any function, um, we can associate this norm, and then uh, we have the definition of the transfer operator. So, it's going to be a family of operators, so for any t in R, uh, we define a transfer operator. What's it going to be? It's going to be a linear operator defined on the only abandoning space I've defined. And it's this space to itself. So it takes a C1 function to a C1 function. 
functions to functions. And it's defined by taking your function f, so f is going to be a uh, c1 function on the interval into the reals. And then I apply my operator, and at a point to x in the interval, I just average over the images of uh, the point x under my contractions. So if you recall some time back, I had k contractions on the unit interval. And so what I do is I look at f t i of x. So it's the same function, but evaluated at these k different points. So I'm moving stuff around by the contractions, but then I'm weighting it by the derivative of the map raised to the power t. Looks a bit like the thing that was in the in the uh, definition of this complex function because, of course, we're looking for the same objects really. But basically, uh, that's the definition of the operator or a family of operators. Uh, again, Mark? yeah. I mean, it's, it's, this section doesn't matter what you're doing in raise to the power t or to the power minus t. Uh, here I'm, I'm raising it to the power t because the derivatives are contracting. Oh yeah, that's not true. So that is, it, yeah, yeah, it, yeah. it doesn't make any real difference, yeah, yeah. except I probably make a mistake later, right. and that's it. Okay, so, so uh, I've got a bunch of operators, and uh, the good news is that this is supposed to help me find out something about the uh, dimension of a limit set. So it would be kind of nice if this operator had some connection with the dimension via the pressure, because it's the only game in town. And so the observation is that this um, operator, this operator, has uh, a maximal eigenvalue. Which is going to be e to the p of I'm hoping. Okay, modulo signs in this. So I've, I'm defining it in this particular way, and it's going to have some property. And the property is that as an operator, its spectral radius is equal to e to the p of t. In fact, it has an eigenvalue there, which is its maximal eigenvalue. Have a question? Sure. Uh, so if you take uh, the term uh, determinant of i minus z times lt, uh, you obtain this uh, function g of z t. Which wrote before? Yeah. Uh, for, for me, it looks strange because here uh, you have the derivative only raised to power t, but the formula for t of z t, you also had the denominator, yeah. which had no power t, right? That's correct. Huh. Yeah, so, so that was an artifact to the fact that here we're looking at the operator acting on c1 functions. I see. So here I, I can't define the determinant because if I look at the, the spectrum of this operator on C1 functions, then it's not a um, trace class operator. What happens is that it has some essential spectrum, which I have to live with, uh, and then it's got this maximal eigenvalue sitting around called e to the p over t. Um, in the case of uh, the second method, when I was looking at it, there was an underlying operator, which I didn't define, which in fact is the same operator, but acting on analytic functions. And in that case, it would be a, trans uh, it would be a trace class operator. The, the, the definition of a determinant would make sense. And, and what does it mean to be a uh, determinant? Well, it's defined in terms of the eigenvalues and the traces and stuff like that. And when you compute them, you sit down and compute them, this, this denominator comes out. So it's continuous spec from the ZP. Yeah, in that case, it's a compact operator. It's even better than compact. It's trace class. All the eigenvalues sum up, and, and you can do explicit computations, and that's the formula you get. Here, the operator has, uh, is a bit, so the operator has worse spectrum. It's got this sort of lump in the middle, but like the sun being surrounded by the planets or something. Um, but it's, it's, it's an inconvenience. So if I were to try to do the determinant stuff, what would happen is that I don't get, a, I don't get an analytic extension so far. It's a kind of reciprocal thing. I couldn't keep going, and that's because of this, this essential spectrum here. So the subtlety that comes into the calculation in that case, we're nowhere near doing it in this case, just because we have much worse spectrum. But the upside is we don't have to restrict ourselves to looking at analytic functions. And in fact, we're actually only interested in, in the uh, dimension, which is something that comes out of the top eigenvalue anyway. Um, 
So let me briefly, uh, in the remaining five minutes, tell you what this method is. Um, so having written down this property, let me just say at the bottom, uh, if we're aiming to, to find the uh, dimension of um, x, well, how do we do that? Well, by the Bowen formula, um, we want to find a value t, which will be the dimension of x, uh, such that um, L of t has 1 as a maximal eigenvalue. All I'm saying here is that the, the Bowen form is being rewritten in, in terms of this operator in a rather obvious way from, from the definitions. Okay. But how are we going to how are we going to find a value of t for which um, this operator has has one as an eigenvalue? That's my declared aim. If I can find a value of t for which the spectral radius, the, the maximal eigenvalue for this operator is equal to one, I'd be relatively happy. I noticed in the lectures last week that uh, given by uh, Francois Le Drapier, he was always happy. He kept saying, I've done this, so I'm happy. Uh, so my, my happiness in this case will come from finding a value of t for which the spectral radius is equal to 1. And so the approach, approach, uh, approach, hard to read. Um, well, it's kind of obvious in this sense. So we want to find. We want to know what this value of t is, so we want to check. We want to check <laughs> if we have that uh, t zero is less than uh, dimension of x less than t one. So let's say given uh, t zero less than t one, we want to check if this is true, and it's sufficient. Therefore. Uh, to show, this will require me getting the, the, the uh, signs the right way around, that the pressure of T0 is greater than or equal to 0, is greater than or equal to P of T1. It's meant to be P's, not rows. And that's just by the picture I drew before. So by the Bowen formula, if we plot the pressure function, it looks like that. And so what we'd like to find is the value for which this is t. We'd like to find a value for which is equal to zero. So if we have two lucky guesses of t0 and t1, and one of these guys is uh, positive and the other guy is uh, negative, then by the intermediate value theorem, which I used to teach to students in the first year, um, that will be enough. Like one. Sorry? This is like root of one. You are, yes. Easy. And so, how would. But how. Pressure how is now root of 3, the pressure from root of 1. There you go, yeah. <laughs> so, let me, let me, in the remaining uh, three minutes, tell you how to do this. Uh, well, so to check this, to check this, so let me just say uh, my Bowen and uh, intermediate. Um, or just monitors, and this is your space. Or pressure. Okay, so how do we check this? Uh, we apply a simple lemma. And the lemma is uh, the following. So my note is denoted simple lemma. So you give me a value of t0, and I want to show that the, uh, the pressure function uh, p of t at that value is bigger than the 0, and I want to show at the value t1 that it's less than 0. So I'm going to use the following lemma. So let's assume, oh, I don't want to chalk, assume we can find a function, and we'll call it f0. It's going to be strictly positive, and it's going to be in my space. So it's F0 is in some space. It's in uh, C1 
that is 0, 1 of R, and I need a bit more chalk. So it's in my, in my Banner space, it's just a C1 function, but it's going to be strictly positive. And let's assume I can find one of these with the property that um, when I apply the transfer operator with that value of t0 to the function I've just thought of, then at any point x, it gets bigger. So this is for all x. Let's assume that's true. Well, if that's true, then it's going to imply that uh, the pressure of t0 is greater than zero. And similarly, if I wanted to prove that T1 had the property of the pressure was smaller than one at that value, let's assume that um, there exists a function F1, it's going to be positive, I'm going to assume that F1 is uh, a C1 function, And let's assume that it has the following property, that when I apply the operator with that value, the function f1 of x, it goes down. This is going to be f1 of x, and this is going to be true for all points in my interval. Then this is going to imply that the pressure of t1 is going to be less than or equal to zero, which would then tell me that the dimension was in this particular interval. And at the risk of encroaching on your time, let me just draw a slight picture people that don't like reading equations. So the first one is saying that I'm taking the interval at 0, 1. I'm cooking up some particular function, uh, which I'm calling uh, f0. Here is f0. And then I'm applying the operator and every point's going up, so the entire graph goes up. This will be out of oh, horrible chalk. This one will be um, L of uh, T0, F0. So it just goes up. And for any point X, you've gone up. And the second one is just saying that you take an interval of uh, 0, 1, then for any function uh, F, one, you apply the operator and the image function, every point has gone down. So this would be L of T1 of F1. So at any point I check it, um, I'm going to have this property. And if I can, if I can find functions uh, F1 and uh, F0 with this property, and I've made good choices of T0 and T1, then this will be enough to tell me that the uh, dimension is in this interval. And that's, in fact, how all most of these longer estimates are done, just by making suitable choices of T0 to T1 and F0 and F1. So I'll talk about how to do that in the next lecture, and then I'll also uh, press on a bit to talk about uh, the Akinet experiments as well. And that's a very parallel story. And that's it. It's time for coffee, I'm sure. Uh, what happens uh, if uh, one of the TIs, for instance, have uh, derivative zero at some point? Well, it might depend where the point was, and, and it might depend on the other derivatives. Um, but the method of proof is so simple that it's not too difficult to check in individual cases what happens. The proof, the proof is literally uh, three lines or four lines. It's, it, it uses almost nothing. So I, I, I will be able to ask you exactly the same question as so I've written the proof down. You'll be able to read the proof, answer the question for me. Well, I guess simple levels would uh, be true, but what about uh, the statement about the dimension? Ah, well, okay, so, so the property, the Bowen formula, um, uh, if, if you have in different fixed point, then life gets more complicated, but fortunately you have in front of you an expert on such cases. Well, if you have in different point, then it still holds uh, yeah. in some... Yeah. Yeah, the, 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 the smallest zero of the pressure function. Yeah. But if you have critical point, it really is unknown. Uh, because you don't have bounded distortion then and bounded formula, any kind of bounded distortion and bounded formula is, uh, okay, uh, it's really tricky, it doesn't, doesn't work if there is a zero, uh, the point with derivative zero. Yeah. In different points, it's fine. Expl explaining in part why I avoid all the hard cases, I just did the easy things. 
Yeah, so what, if you have an instant spectral gap, right? Or, well, so we'll have, is there any way of... We, we don't need a spectral gap in the proof. No, I haven't given the proof, but there, there, you don't need a spectral gap. In fact, you don't need the functions uh, F0 and F1 to be C1, they can just be continuous. So for the second approach... Well, the second approach is, is, is consigned to the trash can of history. Maybe it's ash can of history, I'm not sure. You're saying for the third one you don't need a spectral gap. But for this, for this one we don't need a spectral gap in this trick. You need something, but you just don't need a spectral gap. So, the key, dif key difference between method 2 and method 3 is that method 2 uses the transfer operator on analytic functions, whereas method 3 uses it on C1 functions. That's correct, yes. So, what if you consider it acting on CR functions for some R strictly greater than 1? So then my understanding is this, the essential spectrum would be concentrated in a smaller yeah. ball, is that right? So That's it would right. help you to then extend the determinant a bit further. It, it, would, it would tell you that the determinant extended to a larger uh, region. Um, but I don't think you'd immediately get much payoff from that. I mean, you might get a, a slightly faster... Um, I mean, you, you certainly get that when you do the expansion for the, the Taylor series expansion for the, the function that the coefficients go down a bit faster, because that's what, that's what it means, which might help in some respects. Um, I don't know if in practical terms it would be much of a payoff, though. But you would get slight, something slightly better. Thank you.